this is In Fintech, the podcast for the global fintech community, brought to you by EC1 Partners. Good morning. Um, welcome to uh, In Fintech. Uh, I'm Simon Iglesias from EC1 Partners. I'm joined this morning with uh, all by Miles Bertrand from Mambu, who's the managing director for APAC. Uh, Miles, thank you for taking the time. I know it's taken a little while to uh, to, to get this get this sorted, but uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it would be good to to, to know or to kickstart this with just um, a little bit more about who are Mambu. Yeah, who, oh, thanks, Simon. Mambu. It's great to be here. Um, and and you're right. It's uh, I seem to live myself live my life on video conferencing right now, and uh, it took us to actually get back into the office before you and I managed to have a VC call, which is uh, makes it even more amusing. Um, look, look, Mambu is a is a um, a financial services organisation. We provide basically core banking capability in the cloud. So we allow new and old and well-established banks to move to the next generation technology to allow them to move at the speed that the market's demanding and the expectations that customer have around new products, services, and then how banks service them from a a digitization point of view. So, um, you know, we've been in business now about 11 years, um, formerly out of Europe, but we now cover about 65 countries. We've got about 300 deployments globally. And here in Asia Pacific, we work with about 30 customers across nine countries. Uh, and we're experiencing incredibly rapid growth. We've grown over 100% year on year for the past four years in a row, uh, which is quite astounding considering the current environment, uh, which makes life challenging, but also makes life pretty exciting at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's been a great success story to, to watch from maybe even outside the business. But before we talk a lot more about Mambu, um, how did you end up here? Was this kind of always the, 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 the driver or career goal to get into a sort of unicorn-driven type fintech? Or? Yeah, it's look, look it's, it, it's an interesting story. Like I've actually worked for sort of lots of different organizations, but my sort of the last two or three roles have been sort of with very big organizations. And... I just happened to get a phone call from someone I knew where I was just at a decision point in my life about what I was going to do next. I was either sort of going to stick with what I was doing and sort of, you know, in my days in a very sedate and lazy environment would be one way to describe it. Or was I prepared to sort of have a bit of a risk and look at something net new and, you know, really I'd say, you know, as Aussies would say, give it a crack. And, um, you know, in, in hindsight now, three and a half years later, it's probably the best thing I've ever done in my career. So, you know, for those of those listening out there, you know, sometimes you sit there and you um and ah, but, you know, sometimes if you're prepared to take on a little bit of risk, then can be incredible reward at the end of it as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think um, j- just on that point, I guess, um, sitting on the side of the fence where I sit, I, I always say to a lot of kind of candidates, if you like, it's about backing the right horse. Um, if you look at Mambu as a horse in a race, I mean, the growth that you guys have experienced, I mean, the level of funding and so forth is, is impressive to say the least. Uh, how has the situation with COVID had an impact in terms mm. of how you scaled or uh, against plan yeah. or especially in APAC? It's, a, it's actually, yeah, and that's, you know, I, I mean, every every webinar and every roundtable I talk about over the past 18 months, COVID is a topic of a conversation. But I think in this scenario, it's really important to understand, and like, it's been incredibly challenging for us as a business. I'll give you some scary statistics. When COVID, when COVID started, man, we had about 350 people globally. We now have 750 people globally. So we've, all, yeah. we've doubled up our business and head count just through the COVID p- pandemic period. The scariest statistic is more than 65% of those new starters have, one, never met anyone else from Mambu face-to-face, or two, have never actually been to a physical Mambu location. So we've had to learn to onboard, get people immersed in our culture, try and let them become Mambuvians, all dealing with the pandemic and all the associated things. And you know, we as a business, we hold our culture very, very dear. It's one of the, the key fundamentals. And Simon, and you, you and I you and I talk about this on a regular basis, where I say, I don't care how good they are on paper. If they, had, if they don't work with our culture or can't fit with our mantra, 
they're not they're not gonna be they could be more disruptive to my business than an asset so take back to the level where you've had to do everything remote it's been incredibly challenging but it's also been really rewarding the thing for me which i've really noticed is the ability for people to adapt um you know a lot of people in their career have lived their life in you know an, an you know an 8 30 to 5 o'clock job in an office five days a week and now they're thrown in the to the scenario where you're going to work from home well they have worked from home in a lot of cases more than 99 percent of the time over the past 18 months um it, it it's amazing how humans adapt and also you know, as we've expanded, like we don't we haven't just done that here in Singapore, in our Singapore office or in our Sydney office. We've actually been onboarding people right throughout about five or six other countries as well. So yeah, it's 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 amazing how quickly it, with people with the right mindset really adapt very quickly and they get into the flow and they get into the cadence. And mm. the, and the thing for me, that's what's been incredibly impressive. It's um it, it, it's interesting. I uh, I guess when I would say that a lot of fintech struggles to hire good people or find good people in in APAC, but but some obviously going way against the grain here and continue to scale, which is which is great. Um, but but it, I, I think that's also um, you know that's the the challenge of being an organisation like me as well because I think if I look at us globally and and I'll narrow it down to Asia Pacific, I mean APAC is quite a conservative market, particularly with people from a wanting to change jobs, take on that little bit of risk, particularly when there's a pandemic going on, mm. people tend to sort of bunker down and get quite conservative and combine that with our fastidious nature and how fussy we are. And unfortunately, you've had to experience this because of the number of candidates we've rejected from you. But, um, you know, it's, it, it is, that is also added to the challenge, but we've actually managed to overcome. And I think that's the benefit of, some of the points you raised before trying to do this three and a half years ago four years ago where we were completely unknown i wouldn't have been able to attract anybody but the fact that we actually have been really fortunate to sort of reach that double unicorn status our brand is sort of well recognized and our in our niche of the financial services industry that we are now really attracting a lot of talent or when we proactively go to people who aren't necessarily looking for a role, but we say, hey, we would like to talk to you. Nine times out of 10, they want to talk to us. Mm. And I think, so that's again, I guess one of the benefits, I think probably smaller fintechs. And I do know some of my colleagues and other organizations that are a little bit smaller than us and still just coming up that growth curve are really struggling to find people. Mm. Um, so we have been a little bit fortunate that our brand power now has given us that ability um, to attract talent. Mm. Well, when you say Mambuvium, I'm, I'm always quite interested just to hear from the horse's mouth, but what is a Mambuvium? What, what makes a, a decent Mambuvium? I think um, sort of the, the key things for us are team, collaboration, um, no politics, no hierarchy. Okay. So even though as we grow up as an organization and get more mature, it's people don't come in with an attitude or they don't come in with, well, this is the way that I used to do it where I wore trying to impose um, how they've like, they, people come in very much with open minds. And I think we have this incredibly collaborative mindset and approach to how we do things, you know, even, even at our CEO, will still jump into Slack channels and help people with support tickets and issues. And, you know, and I think the last, the, one of the funniest things I heard recently is he's still quite proud that 10% of the underlying code in our platform is still his, it's still got his name on it. He's still super proud of that after, you know, 11 years. So, you know, there's, it's that, I think that's part of the mantra. And, you know, we have a real sort of fun atmosphere, collaboration, and, and we're an incredibly diverse group as well. I think, you know, the number of nationalities now and the coverage we have, even in our team in APAC, I think we've got something like 23 different nationalities just in our team of sort of 65 people across Asia Pacific. So, you know, we, we really are a, a real mishmash of all sorts of backgrounds and capabilities and experiences, um, but it works for us. And I think that's what makes an a an Mambuvian. And I think, and, I, and as I said at the start of when I talked to you, 
on paper, people can be amazing, but if they don't align with that main boat, that culture, then they just won't fit in and then they won't be a Mambubian. And it's something that we're really striving to hold on to as we grow. And it's very hard. It's very hard as you get up to sort of 750 and we, we, we hope to be a thousand people by the end of the year. And as I said, more than half of those have been onboarded during the pandemic. It's very, very hard to maintain that culture and allow that to continue to, to grow without falling into the trap of just trying to, you know, become too much like a, a big business. Mm, that's a crazy start. A crazy start. Mm. Um, about is yourself as a leader. Um, obviously, when COVID came about, I guess there was a plan to scale in Asia and so forth. And with, with COVID happening, you've obviously onboarded a lot of people remotely and so forth. Has has this scenario or the environment we live in um, meant you've changed your leadership style or direction in, in, in Asia in any way? Or not? Not really. I don't. I don't think I have really. I think I've just more adapted. I try and be exactly the same human, and I try to lead exactly the same way. I've always. I know it will sound like a bit of a cliche, but I. I always try and position myself as a servant leader. So I've always tried to surround myself, my team with people that who are way smarter and better than me. Um, because if they succeed, then they don't, by default, they make me look good, which is sort of a little bit of a selfish response to that. I think, but also from day one, the one thing I've always done is I've interviewed every single person. So they may go through a whole process with the rest of the team, whether it's through the talent team, whether it be through who their direct manager will be, or within that subsection of our capability, whether it be partner management, sales, ops, board. but at the end of the day, I still meet and talk to every single person before we offer them the final job. Um, because I really want to do that sort of last sense check to make sure I think they will be the right fit for our business. But the other thing, you know, but it's little things like I will personally on their first day, I'll personally call them and spend half an hour with them and and let them know that there's no all those key things i talked about we're a team we collaborate there's no hierarchy there's no politics we can call each other when we, whenever we need to to interact and i think it's little things like that um which make it really interesting i've been very fortunate that um i've had a lot of people come and work for the business who used to either work with me or, or on the periphery of where I've worked previously, which has really helped as well. It's allowed us to build the team really strongly. But even then more recently, uh, I actually had my old boss join the team. And, and that's quite ironic that someone who I used to work for is now here actually working, working for me. And even he says like, it's just the culture and the way this place is, is just quite amazing. And, and the way it is so it's really um for me it's quite humbling um the success that we're having the way our business is growing um and, and i just and the only reason that has happened is that we've been able to build an amazing team mm. who who like at the end of the day they make me look good and um, i'm very lucky from that perspective um mambu's done a great job obviously scaling in asia and you, you you've taken an approach of building out regionally um within given countries and so forth, which is, which is quite different to some of your competitors as such. Um, yep. Is that model working well? And does, does that mean that other competitive models are, are, are probably less effective? Or I, I'm just all curious to get your opinion. Look, I, th I think it's fun. It, it seems to be working very well for us. Um, where particularly in certain markets, we've made quite strategic hires. So what we've done is we've gone in and hired quite senior people who've had very good experience, great networks and great connectivity. So what they're doing is complementing our model, having that on, on that ground, on the ground expertise network and, and understanding. We tried for the first couple of years, we did it very centrally out of Singapore and out of Sydney. But I think COVID has really shown, you know, it's incredibly difficult to do business in Vietnam and Thailand without people on the ground. Like it's, and, and we have still succeeded, but it's not this and but the fact that we've put sort of general managers and small teams on the ground in Vietnam and, and Thailand and a couple of other other countries in the past three to four months, we can already see the benefits of that. And I think also those local markets like that, it shows that we're committed to that market. It shows that we really believe what's going on in that market, that we're actually prepared to put quite senior people on the ground to really drive 
and understand. And it's important because it's a two-way street because it allows us to get the right sort of feedback from those markets as to what's happening, what we need to do. So I think we sort of have adjusted that a little bit through COVID. We probably accelerated how quickly we've done that, um, but already we're seeing the benefits of that. Nice, nice. Um, my opinion on fintech and different types of financial technology businesses is they quite often follow a cycle. Um, do, do, you, do, do you think, and this is just an op open-ended point, the obvious digitalization in banks plays into Manbury's hands really nicely at the moment. Is, is this a cycle that will kind of die down in say two years, three years, four years, or do you think this is, this, this, there's a lot of momentum there to, to, to roll on for, for many more years to come? Or? I, 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 I think it's going to continue. Okay. I think the interesting thing we've seen is that we already knew the digitization cycle was coming and consumers were driving different behavior and, were, and particularly the, the, the generational change that's going on at the moment. So big banks were already having to think about, well, well-established banks were already having to think about how they service consumers that want to do everything over their phone. They don't want, never want to go to a branch ever again and they want things rapidly and quickly and they want to see innovation. They want to see new products a little bit quickly. I think all banks had a plan to do that but some of those plans are in three, four, five, six mm. years time, and they were sort of going to incrementally get there. What, what, what the pandemic has done is it's just driven that, accelerated that thinking, that change. So you've seen the, the neos and the digitals come and then the, the evolution of the super app. So, you know, Grab getting very heavily into financial, you know, Gojek getting, um, partnering up with banks across the region, um, you know, Tell, big telcos starting to play in that space as well and offer financial services. So that was happening. And then the big banks are sort of going, okay, we'll get there. And, but I think we've seen rapid acceleration. And if I look at our, our pipeline and our opportunities and who we're getting engaged with, it has, it's very much shifted away from, you know, we were the go-to partner for sort of digitals, neos, and then also these guys looking to diversify. Now you've got, big tier one banks coming to us and saying we can't spend three years developing something or a project we need the ability to do things quickly prototype fast deliver so even the big banks are now moving away from these sort of big bang projects and they're moving to this incremental transformation that we're seeing as well so we've seen a diagrammatic shift in the market i think fortunately for us we were sort of already in that market, seen as the leader with sort of, you know, in 65 countries with lots of deployments with a really good pedigree. So it's really accelerated just that sort of opportunity for us. And I really think the momentum in the market is going to continue because one of the interesting things we've seen is that a lot of regulators now, even traditional regulators, are going to the big banks and saying, look, you couldn't respond to the pandemic quickly enough. We understand that, but what you've got to do is fix your systems and make sure you've got the capability. So if anything like this ever happens again, you can respond super quickly with things like payment holidays. You can get a COVID-19 loan out the door. You can fast get prototypes out there quickly. You can support your customer base. So yeah, I, I think we're really gonna see this momentum continue. I mean, in some markets, we're really seeing it accelerate in sort of quite traditional markets. I mean, even even in uh, quite traditional banking markets, we're seeing regulators come out with, okay, we want to drive digital mm -hmm. licenses. We want to drive digital adoption. And I think what's really, the thing which excites Mambu and one of the things we were founded on was around financial inclusion and financial literacy. Our, our founders what, just basically wanted to make banking better. And they felt the way to do that was to make technology more accessible. So what the pandemic has also done, it's really driven a lot of markets that were very cash heavy and underbanked, that they're now saying we need to be able to provide the capability for those to actually be able to interact digitally. And, and so I think you're seeing lots and lots of different drivers that this, this trend isn't going to go away. I, th I think when I first started driving you crazy, we, we first met, it was probably... What, what do you mean? You still drive? Okay, me. right. I still drive you crazy. But when 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 I first we first probably connected maybe four years ago, Mambu is this relatively unheard of name um, in Singapore. I think if I remember correctly, maybe seventeen, fifteen, or sixteen, or seventeen people. 
with this ambition to grow. Obviously, the last three years or four years since we met, it's, it's completely blown up for the for the right reasons. Where what what do we expect to see from Mambu in say the next three to four years? Look, I think our, our vision for the business is we just want to, con- we, we sort of had this challenge for ourselves. We just want to continue growing 100% year on year until until it just becomes feasibly, feasibly impossible. Um, we're on track to grow well over that this year again, um, so w- which is great. I think next year we're setting ourselves a goal to be something similar. So we just want to continue to be who we are we have a very clear philosophy. Like we don't want to start offering more more services or more products or everything. We, we we have a philosophy that we do one thing and we do it very very well, and we want to continue to do that. So we'll just continue, I think, to see ourselves service servicing organisations and working with partners who basically do want to sort of move to that sort of next generation cloud first, API first approach to providing core banking capability and then in turn we hope that will then drive them to be able to offer you know more capability better digitization and better products and services to their customers as well so our plan is still fundamentally to grow you know from that perspective um, and from a people point of view i think currently I'm, I'm hoping by sort of to be around 90 people across asia pacific by the end of the year and then the plan next year probably will be get, get that probably close to sort of maybe 130 140 by the end of end of next year, 150. So probably won't we won't continue to grow twice as much from a people perspective. Um, we're sort of getting to that sort of um, base where we we've we've got a lot of capability in region, but we will definitely continue to grow. We will definitely continue to invest very very heavily in this region. Um, our our board and our founders continue to be very very excited about about Asia Pacific as a market. It's, a, it's now becoming a very fast follow, follower of all the digitization, digital banks, and what you've seen in Europe. Um, and I think there's a huge amount of innovation going on down here. And we really see ourselves as an enabler for that, for, for, for any organization that's wanting to get into financial services. And, and, that, and I think that's the thing that's super exciting is we're constantly coming across organizations that say, hey, I don't want necessarily want to be a bank but I want to be able to offer financial services to my customers. I've got, you know, I've got 20 million loyal customers. How can I help servicing them? How can I provide better capability to them? And for us, I think that's what's super exciting. And um, I've always kind of, my understanding is Mambu is always very focused on kind of servicing the banks or disrupting the, the banking sector as such. Did, does it have a buy side offering? Is it, is it, tar- or are you targeting kind of insurance, asset management and so forth? Is that a, a big focus or? Not at the moment. So we really focus on retail and business and commercial banking at the moment. Um, we are looking at um, moving into things like potentially wealth um, down the track, but that's sort of a part of sort of our longer term strategy. So, so at the moment, we're really servicing our retail and commercial side. We will look to diversify and move into providing you know wealth and, and that capability. Um, and that's we'll see we'll see where that goes. There's no fixed plan at the moment, but there's certainly a lot of work going into what could be next for the organisation at the moment. Fair enough. And uh, Mars, I always thought you were Australian, but you're actually a, you're actually a Kiwi. Um, that, well, don't don't call me Australian. That's insulting. No, no, no. I'm, I, I, I'm not. I used to think that, but um, Partic- particularly when we talk about rugby, Simon. Well, I remember I bumped into to you on the plane on the way back from Japan, and uh, you, you, yeah, I think you spent the whole I was the crying. whole world I was, I was crying. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, England, uh, be the all blast. During um, obviously this period of kind of quarantining and traveling and no traveling and split from families and work and so forth, it, it, rugby's obviously a big passion of yours. Is that, has that been your, uh, your kind of your release from work? Or? It has been my release. I mean, actually, um, I mean, I actually have run the Gordland a couple of times. So I spent more, more than a month in hotels in Australia this year quarantining. Um, Obviously, my, my my family is actually back in Australia while I'm here in Singapore, so that does make it a little bit tough. So, and and actually, I am I'm actually leaving this weekend. I'm actually going to Europe. So the, oh, wow. the executive team of Mambo is getting together for the first time in two years. Um, so run, running the gauntlet to do that, and then I'm not sure what it's going to be like coming back. To be perfectly honest, but yeah, I mean it's 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 been hard. Um, I think uh, for a lot of people, I've been a little bit 
luckier than some that I've actually been able to make the triple a couple of times and see my family. Um, and I know a lot of people out there haven't. Um, it's and and I think mental health for me is something else that we really we're really focused on with a lot of our team across the region is how do we as an organisation how do we support them, how do we allow them? So you know we looked at things like we 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 basically gave everyone sort of a, an allowance to go and actually fit out home proper as a home office wow. so people could go and buy sort of desks and chairs and monitors and things they wanted to do. So we did a lot. We, we did as much as we could to support that as well, because I think that's been a really important part that you just can't focus on growing your business. You just can't focus on hiring people. You do need to really focus on maintaining that mental health and, and, and the associated parts that go with that as well. So, um, yeah, it has, it has for me personally, I think it's been quite reflective on a number of, a number of fronts. So yes, I've become a, any, any opportunity to watch rugby or um, and, and, and even even delves into the depths of, of Xbox and PlayStation when required. Very nice, very nice. Um, my last question, because I try, and, I try and keep it to half an hour, because I know you're a busy guy. Um, you, you wrote an article or, or, or spoke on an article recently about the, uh, the, the Kodak moment, I think you called it, in, um, in, in banking. And I guess obviously Mambu really capitalizing on that. Is, is that moment happening now? Or has that moment happened? Or? I, I, I think so. Um, and the reason why I think that is if I look at all the conversations we're having at the moment, um, the themes are the same. But the thing which makes it really interesting is those the, the, the types of organisations we're talking to are top 10 banks in the mm. world, down to neo startups. To, and they're all talking about the same thing, which is the ability for them to be more, more agile, service their customers better, be able to react, um, react to market trends and needs. And so you're seeing, you know, the, the, the bigger, the established banks now are sort of realizing that they can't take nine months to deliver a new product or they can't take Oh, we're going to do a big system or a platform or technology upgrade, and then that's that's going to take two years. And at the end of the two years, guess what? Now what you've deployed is obsolete because the market's already moved so quickly. So, I think I think we're very close to that sort of Kodak moment. If I have a look at the types of conversations and the organisations that we're talking to, and the commonality of they all are looking to get to the same sort of outcome, as you're seeing that, you're actually seeing that convergent of. Um, digitals and established banks and if you look at certain markets um, there's lots of acquisitions going on already like in Australia you know National Australia Bank acquired 86400 one of the digital banks and the reason why they acquired that they said was for the technology so they know that they couldn't actually keep going and doing another big core upgrade project or do something themselves so I, I think is it the exact Kodak moment Maybe, but I think we're certainly well on the way where a lot of people are really thinking, hey, we just can't keep re repeating the sins of the past. We have to think differently. And I guess that's one of our big mantras when we talk to organizations is you can't digitize or you can't be a digital bank by, by applying the same methods or the same way of thinking that you've done things in the past. Mm -hmm. You have to think differently. You have to come at it with a new view. And I think that's one of the most important things. I always say to banks and, and any anyone we talk to right now, it's it's not about the technology, guys. The technology exists. It's proven. It works. It's about you. It's about your cultural mindset. And we're starting to see that cultural change within big organizations and well-established organizations. So I think definitely that the moment's on its way. Nice. Mate, it's been amazing to watch um, Mambu's growth in Asia. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure it will continue. And I, I wish you the best for the for, for this year and the coming years. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. And um, great to hear a little bit more about Mambu. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thanks, Simon, for the time. And again, also thanks to you and your organisation. You have been a, a, a great help on that. You've been a, a good partner of ours and, and helped us find some great talent to, to join our business. So I look forward to that continuing in the future as well. Mate, you're welcome. You're welcome. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. And um, we look forward to catching up soon. Yeah, all right. Speak soon. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Miles. 
You've been listening to In Fintech by EC1 Partners. Find us at www.ec1partners.com or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter or Facebook.